It is a great opportunity to be here tonight and talk to you about Munger Place, um, <clears throat> which is one of my favorite subjects. And I live right in the middle of Munger Place. Might be one of the reasons it's my favorite subject. Um, I'm gonna talk for just a second about the Munger Brothers before I begin to talk about the slides. The story of Munger Place begins with cotton one of the most valuable commodities in the world during the 19th century. It's estimated that at its peak, 10% of the world's cotton was grown within 100 miles of Dallas. And the prairie soil was really, really fertile. Um, and Robert S. Munger worked in his father's cotton gin in Mahia, Texas, and saw how much work it was to gin cotton, uh, to move it from the carts to the gin, to the baling machine, etc., And he figured out some ways that you could use vacuum power, suction, in order to move the cotton through the whole system. Um, and he registered some patents and he moved to Dallas and he set up right in Deep Ellum, the Continental Gin Company, Munger, it had several different names, but a, big company that manufactured gins that he sold all, he and his brother, who became his partner, Stephen, sold literally all over the country, even all over the world, it's reported. Um, and as they traveled across the country promoting their gins, they looked at land development in city after city after city. And in 1902, they came back to Dallas and they sold their portion of the Continental Gin Company to become real estate developers. Um, they purchased a large parcel of land in East Texas uh, and decided they would develop it gradually. It was reportedly a cotton farm at first. Um, and because of their travels, they were really familiar with the city beautiful movement uh, that was taking place in other parts of the country and with the broad medians that usually each great large cities had at least one street that had a wonderful uh, green median. Uh, and they decided that they would have this for Dallas. Um, it was a great time because in 1900, Dallas only had 42,000 people. But by 1910, it had 92,000 people. So the population was doubling. And in 1905, they decided to, time was right to open their uh, development. And why, why did they choose this place and, uh, and time? Well, you can see the loop uh, on here. This is the early streetcar loop that came out Main Street, across Peak, over to State Street, down through what's now State Thomas, and back downtown. And it made that loop. And Peak Suburban Edition was built right off that streetcar line. And beyond that, there were cotton fields. Whoops. Um, so, in 1905, they did their first edition of Munger Place, and <clears throat> it was the first deed-restricted neighborhood in Dallas. Uh, that meant they could keep it single family. They had uniform setbacks, uniform form side yards. Um, it had a, a, a certain amount of money you had to pay to build your house on each street uh, on Rieger, you had to pay at least $2,000 to build your house. By the time you got to Swiss, you had to pay at least 10,000 for your house, um, and, which is actually pretty revolutionary at the time because can you imagine a developer today building a, a subdivision for homes between 200,000 and a million dollars? They really just don't, don't do that. Um, so, the first section of it went from, from north to south. You, we all think of Munger Place today, or at least I do, of, you know, sort of centered on Swiss Avenue, which moves from downtown away from downtown. But in fact, 
Erling Munger place ran uh, the other direction. And what they did was they extended the streetcar and the streetcar came out Columbia and across Collette Street, the second street in from Fitchy. And uh, the grandest homes were built right on Colette, right on the trolley line. And that's why W.W. W. Carew's home was that, on that corner. That's why uh, Higginbotham's home was on that corner. You wanted to be able to walk out your front door and right to the trolley. Um, today, you want to avoid the traffic. But back then, uh, when you were walking, you really uh, wanted to be there. Um, so, those, those were the things that really made Munger Place so attractive. They did street trees. They did it right. They did street trees. They had six-foot-wide sidewalks. They had the, the utilities and the alleys. Uh, they really took everything that they had learned about quality development and put it into Munger Place. They even paved the streets, it is reported, with Bodark blocks. And in fact, the Swiss Avenue neighbors, uh, <clears throat> it is reported in the paper, did a petition. They were so angry that these Bodark blocks made their carriages shake and their you know horses have trouble walking that they uh, petitioned the Mungers to do something about this. And in fact, the Mungers went off on another continental tour and discovered bithulithic paving, smooth black paving that we have throughout Dallas now. And they came back and repaved Swiss Avenue. And I love the fact that <clears throat> our Swiss Avenue was doing petitions, annoyed petitions, even back <laughs> in 1910. <laughs> anyway, um, if you look there, Pink's Edition, which is the pink right below, is a great example of what neighborhoods were like prior to deed restrictions. And it has in the block, the 4800 block right below Fitchu, it has two apartments, it has single family houses, it has duplexes, and they all blend together for a really nice uh, residential mix. Um, Munger Place thrived. And um, very soon, in 1914, they opened the second edition. And the second edition went out to Skillman Street. And what's interesting, you can see, this is the city limits of the city in 1912. Part of Munger Place was actually beyond the city limits. And right, really, this pointer just doesn't work. <laughs> so. I think you'll have to <clears throat> try to figure out where, where things are. Most of I, you I see out there know East Dallas in this area. So um, right there at the city limits, the last homes in the city limits, right by cotton fields, the Greer home was built in 1916, and the Aldrich house was built in 1917. Definitely two of the Brandis homes on Swiss Avenue. And the Aldridge house is particularly important because Mrs. Aldridge was the daughter of the two Munger brothers. So it was related to the entire development that, that, that was there. The architect was the best, or arguably the best, early 20th century architect, Hal Thompson. And the home was built on a broad couple of lots and has been perfectly preserved to this day. So, but I, I find it amazing myself to think of the Aldridge House and the Greer House sitting with cotton fields right beyond. In 1922, the third edition was added right out to La Vista and Munger Place was complete. And you can see it extended out from downtown along Swiss Avenue and Live Oak and Genius, what are called the short blocks of, of Genius Heights today. Uh, nearby areas were developing at the same time. Genius Heights, they added an ex another 
extension of the trawling line into Genius Heights, actually in 1906. And Genius Heights had a different theory of development. They were willing to sell vacant lots. You didn't have to guarantee to develop them. And they actually sold out their first edition of 200 lots in three days. So it was really quite exciting. This is the Junior Heights trolley. Uh, this was the uh, Junior Heights columns that were originally together uh, with the trolley going through them. And then um, this is how the, the neighborhood uh, uh, was platted on much smaller lots in, than Munger Place. Um, here we are, Dallas map again in 1925. Uh, you'll notice there is a country club. Uh, in 1912, the Munger brothers had developed a country club because they were in a great competition with Park Cities. And Highland Park had the new Dallas Country Club built in like 1910, so they had to build a country club uh, uh, as soon thereafter as they could. And if you watch that green, you're going to see something that changed. In the 1920s, the 18th hole became the Lakewood Shopping Center. <laughs> Again, angry petitions because green space was gone and in its place was a shopping center. And that's what the Lakewood Shopping Center looked like when it was first developed. By 1930, Old East Dallas, as we know it, was almost complete. Greenland Hills up there in Peak was added in 1923. Lakewood Country Club Estates in 1928. And the trolley line has now changed. You see the big orange leading from SMU downtown and back out to Munger Place, we now had the Munger SMU trolley. The residents of Park Cities had become very upset because if you lived in Munger Place and you went downtown to shop, um, <clears throat> you went the whole length of Main Street and you passed all the theaters and all the department stores and you could get off. But if you lived in Park Cities, you had to go to the courthouse and change trolleys. <laughs> and the ladies in Park Cities did not like that and so the streetcar line came up with a very clever idea of linking Munger Place and Highland Park on one long line. But by 1930, all these neighborhoods are built out. Lakewood Heights, Lower Greenville neighborhoods, there are a group of them, Genius Heights, Peak Suburban, Munger Place. Um, and in the 1930s, actually, only Stellis is still developing. Uh, the Lakewood Library, the old Lakewood Library, was built in the 1930s. The Lakewood Theater was built toward the end of the 1930s. Uh, and even in 1949, Vokes Brothers built their second, the second suburban department store in Dallas was built in the Skillman Shopping Center. It's that triangular building at the bottom. And this was, for me, because I lived a block away, the most wonderful shopping center in the world, because at the bottom it had a Tom Thumb, and across the street on the other end of the block was an A and P, and there was a Pendry's Pharmacy and a dime store and a um, Nicholson Hardy green place and an Ashburn's ice cream and quite frankly everything that a kid could want was in that one one block shopping center. In the 1940s, Bartholomew came up with a plan for Dallas, a master plan, and he said, Everything east of Fitchu should remain single family. It was built that way, and it really should, should remain that way. And you can stay oriented on all these maps by the green median, one mile median of Swiss Avenue. But in the 1940s also, new uses were intruding uh, and beginning to, to 
come in. Many houses were converted to boarding houses during the war. Um, many people took in, in rumors. Houses were subdivided. And uh, after the war, in the early 1950s, suddenly there were constant requests for special use, special uses, which meant apartments. And uh, I grew up with my mother and Mrs. Aldridge and other of them, women on Swiss Avenue going to City Hall maybe every month or two, it seemed to me, gathering together, going to fight another zoning request. And you know they would come home many hours later, it seemed to me, and they'd either be crying because they'd lost or they'd be jubilant because they won. And that went on for, oh, about six, eight years. And then in 1956, finally the city said, we are going to decide one way or the other. And the Swiss Avenue homeowners, the Gaston homeowners, the Junius Heights homeowners all, you know, pulled together. They hired an attorney. They did a blue book uh, with a legal case saying, don't do this. And the, the other people that contributed were filled with the who's who of Dallas. And they went to the hearing. And it's reported that there were two former Dallas mayors, my father, Wallace Savage, Woodall Rogers, that you've all heard of because of the expressway, former congressman, um, Frank Wilson. But guess what? The city council said, nope. And suddenly, in 1956, there was apartment zoning surrounding Swiss. They left Swiss Avenue only out. In the early 60s, as they watched Gaston sort of falling one by one by one by one, uh, the remaining homeowners on Swiss got together and said, you know, what can we do? And they actually hired a city planner, and they, they decided, okay, if we have to have apartments, well, we at least want nice apartments, like the, or on Turtle Creek. And uh, so they drew up a planned development district for high-rise apartments and actually adopted it, uh, saying, okay, if we have to live here with apartments, maybe they'll at least be nice ones. But guess what? The neighborhood was so deteriorated that no one had any interest in building an apartment. So it was at that point that Wayming Lou, it was about 1972, came to our neighborhood and said, how would you like to be a historic district? And the people that had just finished doing this high-rise zoning looked at each other and <laughs> sort of gasped, and they said, well, yeah, okay, <laughs> sounds like a good idea. We'll, we'll do it again. We'll do a survey. Why don't we do a survey to make sure that this is what people want? And uh, they did a survey. The city was so excited when they got the survey back because, you know, they had a 12% response, and that was a huge response. And, you know, 55% of the people said that they, they wanted this, and therefore they would go forward with this, this historic district. However, when we sat down and looked at the numbers, it was like my mother and Ann Higginbotham and Ann Corton and Mrs. Aldridge had called everyone they knew that could possibly want a historic district, gotten them to respond to this survey. Therefore, there were about you know, 15 people on the whole street that wanted a historic district, and that was it. There was a huge need for education. So out in the lobby, you can see some of the brochures and things that were distributed uh, house to house. Uh, as we worked to become a historic district. Um, it was a mess. This ladder, some of you all know Joanna Hampton. This is her house. It looked like that for about three years. And here it is today. Um, here's some of the kinds of brochures that we put out about every two or three weeks and took door to door, literally. To, we divided up the district and went to every single home. Then, in the middle of trying to become a historic district, suddenly J. Roger Crownrich filed a building permit for a high-rise apartment. 
he thought, oh, it's going to be a historic district. Well, gosh, it'd be great to have a high rise in a historic district. And I remember the day that Wei Ming Liu called me and said, oh, there's a building permit, and it's gone through every department but fire and water. I mean, I, I, it's gone through every department but fire and water. And I said, Wei Ming, it still has to go through fire and water. <laughs> It's, it has to be stopped. And sure enough, the city council voted to deny the building request on the grounds that they were in the midst of creating a historic district. And um, the case went all the way to the Texas Supreme Court, but the city and we actually won. So the high rise was next. Another house, the Seidenfeld's house burned in the middle of our efforts, actually was completely restored. Uh, this house, th we were on our way to City Hall one day, right before we were a historic district, and we were very nervous about what might happen. And as we were driving to City Hall, about four of us in the same car, we saw this had happened over the weekend you know, screeched to a stop and everybody got out of the car and I'm afraid we actually trespassed and went up on the porch to try to figure out are they restoring the house or are they trying to tear the porch off and tear it down. We finally decided that, you know, probably they were restoring and it was okay. So we went on our way and um, about... Three weeks later, we picked up the paper, and here's this full-page article about this young man that has sold everything but his car in order to restore his house. And, you know, we were guilt, felt guilty and ran down with covered dishes and food and got there and discovered his car was an antique Rolls-Royce and probably worth more than any of our houses were at that point. Um, and here is the house today. Whoops, what did I do? I did something. I hit a wrong key. <laughs> She's going to come save me. But I will, tell, I will tell you the story that I didn't used to tell in Dallas. Um, but uh, he had a very unique, if this is a very large house. And it had all been natural wood to begin with, uh, and it had been painted. And so, you know, we went by one month, and there was a girl scraping the entry hall. And then came by, you know, a month or so later, and there was another girl scraping the living room. And another month, and there was another girl scraping the dining room. And, you know, it sort of was working the way through the house before we finally grasped that each girlfriend could stand to scrape about one room before she gave up on becoming the mistress of the house <laughs> and whatever. And I, 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 it was the 70s and so, but I, I was, I never told this in Dallas, but I was in Kansas City and I thought it was safe. So I talked about this and afterwards this really cute little couple came up, you know, sort of with her cane and said, you know that young man you talked about? And I went, yes. And they said, well, <clears throat> that's our son. <laughs> Please tell him if he just gets married, we'll give him that antique pool table he's been wanting. <laughs> so <laughs> I did deliver the message, and he did... Uh, and he did uh, get the antique pool table. So we succeeded in our efforts to be a historic district. And you can see there the boundaries. We made it as large as we could, uh, included Bryan Parkway and La Vista and parts of Live Oak because we thought it was really important not to be an island. Um, we had house tours to present to promote the neighborhood. We got all the publicity we could imagine. We worked on getting uh, street lights for the street replaced. We rebuilt the 
the gates that had been torn down. And, you know, we even wrote a book for the National Trust on what we'd done and how we'd done it. And actually, this book was reprinted three times and used all across the country, the Trust told us, by other people um, wanting to do a historic district. So that was gratifying. But looking at the big picture, looking down and seeing that we were one little narrow street surrounded by apartments, we didn't want to be an island. And so we looked beyond Swiss Avenue. An editorial in the paper said that we didn't want to be an island. We wanted to be a large neighborhood. And the first place we looked was to Munger Place. Um, where I wonder how I get rid of the full view. <laughs> Escape? Oh, that's okay. Sorry. Someone will come do it for me. Anyway, we didn't want to be, we didn't want to be an island, and so we looked at Munger Place and thought, well, the same planners that, oh good, thank you again, that helped us become a historic district on Swiss will help us in Munger Place, because by now, in 1976, a couple of houses on Swiss had sold for almost $200,000, and houses in Munger Place were selling for $15,000, if you could talk anyone into buying them, which we couldn't. We tried to sell one house that had never been subdivided on Junius for a full year, drove every person by that said they just couldn't afford Swiss anymore. No one bought it. We, when we looked at Munger Place, we saw this wonderful, intact neighborhood. So we took Waming Lu to lunch. He had been the planner that helped us with Swiss Avenue, and we discovered that he did not see a wonderful, intact neighborhood. He saw a neighborhood that was red-tagged. And in fact, he told us Munger Place does not meet even one of the national standards for a salvageable neighborhood. 70% absentee ownership, 70% substandard houses, zoned for apartments, and besides it was redlined by Fannie Mae. You couldn't get a loan. In addition, we had this you know, new revolutionary group, the Bodark Patriots, and um, they were, you know, it says here, ready to fight. Their first newsletter talked about giving shooting lessons to the children of Lipscomb School and had the 10 rules for how to have a revolution. I wish I had that paper still. It was a little shocking. Um, and in fact, it was pretty bad off if you got much beyond our one little street. But undeterred, we did a survey and according to our very optimistic figures, you know, only the houses in red were in bad shape. Of course, the gray, we carefully sort of hid, but those are all vacant lots. And um, only the green were things that looked like they were written in relatively good shape. But we decided to do a revolving fund. And I say that a little loosely because the National Trust for Historic Pres Preservation when they came to see the neighborhood, suggested one. They said, if you go and buy houses and you protect them and do a lot of publicity, it will be like putting a good housekeeping seal of approval on the neighborhood, and people will feel safe in buying. So we did that. And the funding for it was pretty amazing. I didn't quite understand at the time how amazing, but we got $5,000 in cash from Martha Heinberg. We got a National Trust Award for $50,000. Um, and they only insured half of it. My uncle did the other half and Tom Bastein. The Lakewood Bank gave us a credit line for $50,000. And then they said, we'll give you 90% loans on all the houses you buy. You know, six month 90% loans. 
And so there was a very active real estate agent, but Doug Newby, that went out and in three months' time had bought us 23 houses, just about. And we bought them with $5,000 cash. And I have to tell you, we were very naive. I was very naive. Um, I, um, <laughs> well, I have to go back. I will tell you this one story. Uh, well, go forward and tell you the story. This house, this was one of our first three houses. And on Friday, I realized I needed to collect the rent that had actually three tenants living in this house. And it looked a little shaky to me. There were three of them in the same street. And I found the sort of biggest, tallest guy on the street that would go with me and drove down on Friday afternoon to collect the rent. And I drove up and I thought, hmm, I think I'll take my rings off. <laughs> and I locked them in the car. You know, we went inside and the first lady said, oh, no, don't have any money today. You know, but I want to show you what's going on in the backyard. They've been doing drugs. So I reluctantly went to look. I couldn't tell they'd been doing drugs. And then I, you know, I went upstairs. I knocked on all the doors very dutifully, asking for the rent. Everyone very dutifully told me that they just really didn't have it today. And I turned around to leave, and the sky was gone. I, I mean, I was in this house by myself. And I went back outside, and here he is in the car. The door's locked when I got there. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? He said, I just, I knew it was all over. I saw the house. I saw you put the rings in the glove department. And then she talked about the drugs, and I wasn't going to stay in that house. <laughs> so, I thought he could have at least told me. Anyway, our first closing that I went to, because I was the chair of this thing and had no business because I never even owned the house, I hadn't brought a check for the down payment because it hadn't occurred to me I had to bring money. Our first letter that we wrote to Fannie Mae, we misspelled escrow as escrow, like lettuce, and had to write a quick another letter saying, oh, so sorry, our, our, our secretary misspelled. We're so sorry. And then <clears throat> the appraisals were very challenging. Ann Piper and Bernie Cohen had to do the appraisals. And, you know, appraisals are based on comparables, and there were no comparables. So, you know, they had to sort of do their best, but they like to say that when they got to one of these houses, they had to bring a ball of string. They were subdivided into three, four, five units. And that they sort of tacked the string down when they went in the front door and go to the house and then had to follow the string back out to find their way back out to the street. And then finally, you know, the first house was appraised. The first house was actually finished. And the Fannie Mae appraiser, the head of appraisals for the city of Dallas, flew in to look at it. And um, he took out a handful of marbles from his pocket. And he put them in the middle of the floor, this big old wood house. And the marbles rolled in different directions. And he said, I, 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 can't, I can't approve this house. Fannie Mae can't live alone in a house. The foundation's obviously cracked. And we went, wait. The found that, you know, no, this house is on Bodart blocks. You know, it's a little curvy, but it's not cracked. The appraiser had never appraised a house that wasn't built on a concrete slab. He never approved a loan on an old house that had been restored before. And it, it actually was a huge crisis for Fannie Mae. They flew in a team from Washington and it did turn out that the reason that they were so interested and anxious to do this program was that they were under 
uh, a lot of pressure from the Senate to um, make loans in old neighborhoods. Most of the country was, in fact, redlined. In fact, they weren't lending on older houses at that point. And Munger Place really was one of their first two neighborhoods in the whole country that they lend, loaned on. The other one was in St. Louis, but I think our, ours was first. Um, anyway, this is this house after. And this was typical Munger Place furnishings with the mini rentals. Uh, we had an urban pioneer tour uh, with our first houses that we had relocated the tenants. Dorothy Masterson, who became the head of the Dallas Tenants Alliance, helped relocate all the tenants. None of them had lived there longer than six months. It was an in-migrant area. It was not like the neighborhoods in the east where generations of people lived in the same neighborhood. Uh, it was a month, a week-to-week -week furnished rental. Um, this was a wonderful uh, article uh, in the paper that suddenly you know, everyone in town saw this, saw what you could buy a house in Munger Place for, and saw that you could get a loan, an actual loan on the house to redo do it and to finance it. And truly, Munger Place, with our 23 houses that we bought and the easements we put on them and our good housekeeping seal of approval of the Historic Preservation League, today's Preservation Dallas, Munger Place was saved. A uh, couple more before and after. And before, it really was a mess. And after, and this was the worst one. I truly did not want to buy this house as the head of the rebombing fund. And the neighborhood real estate agent said, this is what the fund is for, Virginia. You must buy this house. I mean, literally, when you walked into the living room, the floor came down to the dirt, and you were walking on dirt, and then back on wood. But here it is today. We, we bought this house for $12,000, sold it for like sixteen, dollars and at the closing, I was stunned to discover the home improvement loan was seventy-five thousand dollars, which in 1977 was a fortune. Um, this is Fannie Mae's 1976 mid-year report, where they're talking about St. Louis and our neighborhood, and that the time has come. The Urban Land Institute did a study, case study on it, and in fact, today the neighborhood really does look like. Uh, it did only in our dreams back when we started the revolving fund. And a lot of the houses in Munger Place all have the same shape. They're square houses with a hipped roof and a centered gable and a full-width porch. Uh, they have different details. Some of them are like this with exposed rafters. Uh, Others are, are simpler and uh, more arts and crafts. Others of them have columns. But we became very curious. And the whole reason I wrote A Field Guide to American Houses was that I was so curious what it was that we were trying to save in Swiss Avenue and in Munger Place. And that's when I discovered the American four square house, which is what is in Munger Place. There are four rooms downstairs and four rooms upstairs in a square. And they come in all different kinds of variations and shapes. And um, they come from you know the very simple four square in the prairie style to a Swiss Avenue prairie style house to the really grand Higamotham uh, Swiss Avenue Prairie style house <clears throat> and led to the field guide identifying different styles as well as the shapes of houses uh, like the prairie style with the heavy squared columns and the details of the windows and doors that are similar in craftsmen and prairie houses. and. Um, 
Swiss Avenue had so many different styles of houses that, again, my curiosity about what style is this house and this one and this one, you know, led me to discover the mission style and colonial revival in all kinds of forms and the Italian Renaissance. And then our, our Munger Place Gates and Median led me to, in a, the revision of the book that I did three years ago, to look at how many uh, neighborhoods of that era had the same kinds of gates and medians, focal streets, and elaborations, and even the secret of our Dallas street grid is uncovered in one page of this book. Why Elm and Main go one direction and East Dallas another and North Dallas another. It all goes back to land grants. So that's my little advertisement for a field guide to American houses. So the last part is just to tell you how we then completely finish saving Old East Dallas, the Junius Heights columns. And in fact, I see one of our major first donors, my mother's friend, Ruth Sharp Altshuler, who contributed to moving the Junius Heights columns when they were going to be torn down by a road. Um, we discovered everything around us was zoned for apartments, as you all just saw. And that 1,200 acres was all rezoned from apartment to single family. Now, I know how long it took to get the signatures just on the Swiss Avenue district. Doug Newby and Lynn Dunsavage and Lee Simpson is our councilman gathered signatures from that entire 1,200 acres to get it properly zoned. Then, after all this work, in 1978 and up until 1982, we discovered that indeed the other part of the city, while the planning department was helping us do a historic district, the transportation department had in mind all of these road windings, all of them. And you can see Swiss Avenue, and you can see four winding roads through us. Roseland Munger, it's a Abrams blasting through the shopping center. Um, Abrams, <laughs> this, the Roseland Munger Thruway, one block over from Ross Avenue, one block, 120 feet wide it was supposed to be. 120 feet wide, one block from Ross. We found the East Dallas Thoroughfares, a community overview. A hopscotch of road windings they were planning. And then this is the most shopping. See the Swiss Avenue green? You see the North Dallas East-West Freeway cutting through us? And the, um, whatever the other one, the, East, the North South Freeway cutting through us? right in the middle of our neighborhood. It's like, what were they thinking? I mean, how here would save the neighborhood and all of this was supposed to be happening and indeed was happening. So we had the Road Wars, Hank Tatum wrote articles. Planners were forced to reconsider. We actually found a way to, for Abrams to circle around the Lakewood Shopping Center instead of blasting through the middle of it. Simpson and Madrano got a coalition with the council. They rallied the votes, and the planners were a little dispirited. When I finally found, a few months ago, the thoroughfare plan, you can see all the things that are erased, they didn't even do a new one. They just <laughs> erased all, all of the roads that they had planned. So actually, you can still see our neighborhood streets. And I even, uh, my neighbor <laughs> gave me one of her t-shirts. So 
It's once road wars were over, back to historic districts and quickly Munger Place. It was 1988 before it became a historic district, 15 years after Swiss Avenue. Peak Suburban became one in 1995. Peak Suburban has huge, wonderful mansions and small, fun Victorian houses. It's the earliest of our historic districts. New conservation districts. Lakewood became one in 1988. They were not allowed to be a historic district by the city planning. They had the signatures they wanted to be and they were told they weren't old enough. Crazy. Hollywood Santa Monica in 1993, M Streets 2002, M Streets East and Belmont in 2004, Victory Place 2006, Edgemont Park in 2006, and finally, Junius Heights. Junius Heights is sort of the last piece in the, in the puzzle. Uh, in 2006, just 10 years ago, with its wonderful cottages and Tudor and Craftsman cottages. We didn't ignore the park toward downtown. Along the way, we were able to work with Dave Fox and Mary Fox and save the Wilson Block, involve the Meadows Foundation, I should say. They saved the Wilson Block. We just sort of proved the way. We did so, and um, this is my last two slides. I have to tell you, there's still plans that need to be done for East Dallas. We worked so hard and had Haskell Boulevard with a hike and bike trail down the middle, connecting the Santa Fe Trail and the MK Tree Trail. We had Live Oak and Gaston supposed to have uniform setbacks, building lines like in uh, uptown in West Village, and um, five years ago, Haskell came off the thoroughfare plan. The building line pedestrian street designation was removed from Gaston and Live Oak. And today, and I'm telling you this as a finale because there's a meeting in the next couple of weeks, they're wanting to take Gaston, where Garland Road and, and uh, Grand come together, two six-lane roads. They're wanting to turn the traffic down Gaston where it can come right back through our neighborhoods again. So. I hate to say it, but you know, we get so far and we have to keep working on it. I really appreciate your all's being here tonight very much and the opportunity to talk about the neighborhoods that I really do love. Thanks. <laughs>